Anybody cold coming in this morning? <laughs> I was. I thought it was a beautiful, chilly morning. I, I, great fall morning. I got a question for all of you. Have any of you ever heard of Braxton Hicks? <laughs> the ladies are all laughing. One of the first things that they taught me when I was a, a, a lonely EMT student was about false labor. Because, see, I had a When we were doing the EMT class, the first rule that a lady was about to have a baby for our team was Jeff sitting in the front of the ambulance. I didn't do babies. I was not going to deliver a baby. So if some lady said, I'm having a baby, it hurts, I ran. I realized, and, and, and my instructor was like, Jeff, look, just because they say they're having a baby doesn't mean they are. They may feel it. They may feel like they're going into labor. Only a doctor can determine if they're truly in labor. So don't run. Put them in the ambulance. Let the doctor figure that out because it could be false labor, otherwise known as Braxton Hicks. And I begin to think today, and you know, I don't know about you, but with all the things going on in Israel, I'm getting into my Bible and a little bit more. But I begin to realize and wonder, is this... The beginning of birth pangs. Are we beginning to see? And I'm going to tell you this. I think we are. But there's only one person who truly knows. And that's God. This could be false labor. The devil has set it up before. But I, until that time and we know, I'm going to act like it really is. I'm going to put you. We're all going to get in the ambulance and we're going to go towards the hospital. Because that's what I had to do, no matter what the lady said. If she said, I'm in labor, put her in the, put her in the ambulance, get her to the hospital. In all my gear, I do not have a set of footprints, means you delivered a baby. First baby I was ever around was my grandson about a minute after he was born. And I knew it. Mm. But it was beautiful. But I also remember the screams of pain that my daughter was feeling because I was standing outside the door. And it, it was not... It, I didn't think it was joyous. She said at the end it was. Turn with us, turn with me to the book of Matthew. We're kind of kind of start there. And then we're going to jump through some other scriptures today. Because we're going to really begin to kind of look at some of this. And what is, and was going away. And when his disciples came to him, the buildings of the temple. But he answered, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here, one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he set up, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things tell, tell us when these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. For this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings, are, 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 are but the beginnings of the birth pains. Now King James says the beginning of sorrows. Because labor is not easy. But the things that Jesus was talking about, when, when did they really begin to take place? Well, Ezekiel 37, 21 says this. I lost my little tab, so hang on. Ezekiel 37, 21. Then say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone, and they will gather them all around and bring them to their own land. 
and I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. Does anybody know when that happened? When Ezekiel 37, 21, when God took all of the nation, all of Israel, all the Jewish people from out of the nations where they had been exiled in 70 A.D. 70 A.D., Jesus talked about that and, and how the temple was going to come down. When he, when he just talked about that in Matthew 24, when no stone will be left unturned, the temple of God came down in 70 A.D. when Romans destroyed it. And at that time, all of Israel, the house of Judah, the house of Israel, were dispersed to be no more. So, for... 1,870 years, there was no nation of Israel. The Jews were dispatched all across the world. In fact, if you look at some of the political writings from the early 1900s and back into the 1800s, it was called the Jewish problem. From the, they had a Belfort Declaration where they were trying to get them out of one country. Anybody ever watch uh, Fiddler on the Roof? That was about trying to get all of the Jews out of Russia. And going to other places, it was set in the early 1900s, because there was no land for them, and they were in every nation across the world. Sometimes they were forcefully converted into Christianity. Sometimes they did it to hide so they wouldn't be killed, because ever since 70 A.D., the world has wanted to destroy the nation and the people of Judaism. They took away their land, and then you can see it come out in Hitler. They wanted to destroy them by killing every one of them. If you watched this week across America and all these big religious institutions, there were one uh, protest or another calling from here to the river the death for the death of Israel. Kids were said, we will burn and kill the Jewish people on our campuses. Because on May 4th, 1948, a little over 75 years ago, Ezekiel 37, 21 was fulfilled. In one day, one day, Israel was founded. Now, the interesting thing is, Isaiah 66, 8 says this. Who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall a land be born in one day? Shall a nation be brought forth in a moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. Again, labor is suffering and pain and hard, hard things. And so on May 14th, they declared Israel to be a nation. America is one of the first to recognize it. Now, Jesus goes on to say in Luke 21, 24, he said, They will fall on the edge of the sword and be led captive among the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jesus even knew that there was going to be a certain time called the time of the Gentiles. And I truly believe that the time of the Gentiles ended on May 14th, 1948, 75 years ago. And it was restored. Now, most people don't realize that since that time, they have been in constant conflict. The first Israeli-Arab war started May 15, 1948. When the Palestinians, the Arabs, Arabs, whoever, whatever term you want to call them, the, people, the Muslim people of that land began to attack Israel right away. Zechariah 12, 1 through 3 says this. The oracle of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem 
a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The seeds of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. On that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all peoples. All who lift it up will surely hurt themselves, and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. Since 1948, Jerusalem was not even the capital of Israel. It was Tel Aviv. But suddenly, about four or five years ago, America recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And since that time, the nations around them have been gearing up to attack them. Suicide bombings and kids being killed and one thing after another. They have been in constant conflict. 1973 war, the Seven Day War, 1967. You, you can go on. The reason the Internet, uh, Israeli Defense Corps is one of the toughest in the, nation, in the world is because they've been fighting consistently since 1948. Mossad, the spy group, they ain't got nothing on the American CIA. They know, they, do, they know more, they do more, and they're more quiet about it. Israel has been fighting, not just since 1948, but they've been fighting for their very existence since A.D. 70. They've been tried to be killed. They've been kicked out of every country. They have been slaughtered. They have been in constant conflict. Now, part of that is because as a nation back then, they, had, they, they were a sinful nation. They turned away against God. And so there was some punishment that they deserved as a nation. And now God is bringing them back as a group. And it's all going to climax in a certain place. And I think, I truly think, we're heading that way. And even if we're not, we still should be prepared. Again, like, Matt, like Jesus said in Matthew 24, 6 and 8. And if you're not opposed to it, I want you to maybe underline these in your Bibles. I'm going to, read, going to reread it. It says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. Underline that. We are not to be alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. So we need to understand that when all of these things that we're seeing are beginning to happen, we are not to be scared. We are not to be alarmed. We're not to be afraid because, first of all, if they have been written and has been foretold of ever since Israel came a nation in the Old Testament. And, it, and this is just the start. Now, I will tell you, when, when, when I held my grandson in my, grandson in my hands the first time, once I realized his cone head was okay, he wasn't wrong, um, it really was a joyous occasion to see a newborn. And a lot of women will tell you the pain and the sorrow and the suffering comes, and it does sometimes for 36 hours or longer. Um, different things can happen. But immediately once it happens and they have that love of a child, gone. The remembrance of the pain is gone. And that's what we're heading to. That it is going to be painful for a time. But then it's going to get even worse. But then it'll get better. Revelation 16, 16 says, and they assembled them. Oh, hang on, let me get to it. That was my own. Revelation 16, 16. Actually, we're going to go up to 15. Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Ha Megiddo is actually more of the correct terminology. The Valley of Megiddo. And it is a huge, flat valley in the middle of Israel. And when we get there, that is going to be the climactic battle for the end. Jesus also then tells us, I mean, it's going to be cataclysmic. It's going to be a battle that's played out on earth, but it's going to be a spiritual battle between the 
angels of God and the demonic, and it's going to be all of this big thing, and it is going to be the best action flick you've ever seen. Take all of them on TV, and this is going to be more interesting, more powerful, more brutal than that. But Jesus says in Luke 21, 28, Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up. Raise your head, because your redemption is drawing near. What's the first thing most people do when they get into a tough way? Yeah, that's, um, I know I'm going a little fast, but that's Luke 21, 28. I don't know about you, but the first time I hit problems, my head goes down like this. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. I begin to get down. I begin to lose focus, and I begin to get a little, you know, my head gets heavy. I get tired. But, and sometimes your knees can buckle and you can just kind of slump over. You ever seen anybody dejected? I walk around like this. But Jesus said, don't do that. When this world gets rough, and it is going to get rough towards Christians, there, you can read all of Matthew 24 and all that. They're going to come for us. They're going to want to um, ridicule us. They're going to want us not to talk about God. They're going to take our Bibles. They're going to want to fire us. They're going to want to eventually maybe even throw us in prison and in jail. And I'm going to be honest, it's not happening in America yet, but it's happening in other countries. Go to the Voice of the Martyrs. It is happening in other countries where people are dying for their Christian faith. You'll not hear it in the news, but every so often, if you catch Voice of the Martyrs on Facebook, people, Christians in and like the Hindus in Pakistan are killing Christians. They're burning churches. It's still, it is going on. Just because we're protected here, it is going on. So when that happens, we need to do something. We need to straighten up and look up. First of all, I want to say, and this is kind of what I want to close with, is what are we really to do in this time frame? First of all, we need to make sure we're right with God. That you're in that right relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm not saying you've got to be perfect, but that you know who God is in your head and in your heart, and you're doing your spirit-filled best to live like you believe Him and are following Him. Second thing we really need to do is we need to pray for Jerusalem. Psalms 122.6 says this, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. You always have to remember that Jerusalem and that land is the home of God. It's where he put the temple. It's where Jesus died. It's where everything has gone on. We, we may not understand it, but that is the center, focal point of everything. Jerusalem and Israel. It was to be the land flowing with milk and honey. There's a lot of people out there who think that may actually be where the Garden of Eden was before the fall and before everything began to happen. But the point is, that is where Jesus, or God is taking his stand, is in Jerusalem and on the Mount of Olives. So we've got to pray for them. And then we have to do something else. And this is where most people bulk. We have to take the gospel out of our churches, out of our homes, and take it to the world. Acts 20, turn with me to Acts 28, 23. Because, you know, a lot of times we like, you know, I'm Baptist and I like Paul. Which, um, you know, a lot of folks don't like Paul, but I do. In Acts 28, 23, he writes, When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in great numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Here's Paul. 
a Pharisee, a missionary, in jail, in Rome, shipwrecked guy, sore, beaten, everything. And even then, when he's standing at Rome, possibly facing his death, he does one thing. He begins to expound to the people who are coming the gospel message. One translation says not expound, but persuading them about the gospel. Now, he does this in a really unusual way. As you remember, they didn't have the second part like we do. They only had the original. That first covenant, the, the Tanakh, whatever you want to call it, the Old Testament. So Paul started with what he had. He started with the law of Moses. Now, nothing will persuade a sinner quicker that he is in great danger of hellfire when they re he can really re they can really turn around when they realize that they have broken the moral laws of God. Once you come to realize that as a non-Christian that you have broken every law of those Ten Commandments and you begin to think about that, it can scare you enough to make you right with God to go, oh, if you don't know you're doing wrong and then suddenly you realize you've done wrong, it usually wakes up even the dullest, hardest of headed people. Amen. Amen. And that's where Paul started. There's a guy out there by the name of Ray Comfort. He and um, uh, a kid from uh, Growing Pains, Kirk Cameron, used to go out and they would witness and they would start with the Ten Commandments. They would ask someone, have you ever lied? Well, yeah. Well, right, so you're a liar. Yeah. Are you a good person? Yeah. Well, holy, you just told me you're a liar. And they would do that back and forth. They would debate them and point out, oh, so you, so you lied. Have you cheated? And the people then begin to realize how depraved they really are. Well, did, did you look at a person lustfully? Well, so you are a lying adulterous, adulterer. And people begin to do that. And they did that for years, and they got a lot of people. Because the power of the law of Moses is to point people to their corrupt behavior. And then... He says he does something else. He goes to the prophets. Because you tell people how bad they are, and you begin to tell them what their future holds. Uh oh When they begin to see where their life is heading, and the pain and the suffering and the eternal damnation and destruction, it begins to wake them up. And how do you show them that God is true. You show them the prophecies. Because most people don't realize this, but prophecy shows the hand of God throughout time. He can use scripture to show us the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega. Now the only reason God can do that is because he designed it. He's written it. In the skies, in the earth, he has written our future. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He knows. And when you begin to show that, then we know he's getting close. Here's kind of one of the final, and it's an often overlooked sign. Matthew 24, 13 and 14 says this. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. This book has been, in the last 400 years, has been translated into almost every known language. Some of them weren't even known at the time when the translators went. A guy, named, a guy by the name of Ananiron Judson started to go to Myanmar, Burma, whatever name it's under now. 
They didn't have a written language. He had to learn the language, speaking it, and he had to figure out and make an alphabet. They still use his dictionary today, the Judson Dictionary. And he did that in the early 1800s. He's an American Baptist. But now it's been proclaimed through the radio, through TV, through American missionaries. In every, it's everywhere in the known world. So the gospel's out there. And that's the last thing that I see that really needs to be done. So in my mind, everything is ready for God to come back. Only God's going to know when he's going to turn the switch and say, okay. But guess what? Why we are still here before we hear that trumpet, we have some work to do. It really is our calling. This is our time. Paul did it in his time. Martin Luther did it in his time. Other people did it throughout all the ages. Now it is our time to take the gospel to the world in word, in deed, in action. And even if we're wrong, and we're, this may be one of those false times, at least the gospel's getting out. This is our time to straighten up and raise our heads up and proclaim the gospel. Because if you watch TV and you watch 50 of the most prestigious schools in America turn against Israel and call for the killing of one people, America is lost. It's our time. We have been called for such a time as this. doesn't matter when Jesus comes. It does. But... We have work to do until that time. So let's straighten up, raise up, and be about it. There's so many people out there that I love that don't know the Lord. They're lost in sin. They're lost, like if you were here for the Bible study before, they're lost in their own selfishness. They need to know God. And since we don't know the hour, we may come out here and get in a car accident and our time might be over. Don't waste another minute. Because as we go, it is our time. Whether Jesus comes back in the next few years or another thousand years, this is our time. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, I want to thank you today for finding me many years ago. For finding every one of us here and forgiving us of our sins. Lord, we understand what people are going through because we were there. Help us today to be that light, to be the person like Paul who persuades people, expounds on the scriptures, whether it's in the law of Moses and the prophets, to show people what you want. And if we don't think we're smart enough, Lord, the Bible tells us, just open our mouths. You will give us words. You will guide us. You will help us share your message to the world. Help us to be those people today. Help us not to be afraid or not to be fearful of retribution or hatred, Lord. They hated Jesus and that's okay. Let us boldly go to this world who needs you evermore. Thank you, Lord, for loving us when we don't deserve it. In Christ's name I pray, amen. If you